Chapter five, practice test. I've had several requests for this as soon as possible. I had a very busy day. I actually had to work today and um, so it's taken me a little bit to get this together for you. I also had to make a solution set for it because I didn't have solutions for this test, believe it or not. So here we go. Um, determine the derivative for the following functions. So minus e to the x squared. Do you remember that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x? So the derivative would be minus e to the x squared times the derivative of the exponent, which is 2x. So I'll write it out long for you first of all. So we have minus e to the x squared times 2x, which is minus 2x e to the x squared. Okay, letter B, f at x equals x, 5 to the negative x. And these marks, this is just how many marks are worth. Kind of old school. Okay, so we have a product rule. Okay, be really careful. x times something is a product rule. So I'm going to do the first times the derivative of the second. So the derivative of the second, this is like b to the x. So I want b to the x, ln b, derivative of the exponent. Right? Don't forget all those steps. So 5 to the negative x, ln 5 times negative 1. That's the first part. Don't stop. And then the second, 5 to the negative x times the derivative of x, which is just 1. So simplifying that, I have negative x, 5 to the negative x, ln 5, plus 5 to the negative x, this pencil, whoa, look at that. I don't think this is going to work for me. It's. I think it's too small. 5 to the negative x, and then I can throw that away and get out my... This one makes a little bit of clicky noise. It's the only problem. Okay, so I have 5 to the negative x, and then I have negative x ln 5 plus 1 when I factor out that 5 to the negative x x so this one and this one watch around that you're working across your plus or minus sign okay letter c 7 to the x x to the seventh oh, that's a cute little question isn't it okay so i'm going to do the first times the derivative of the second the derivative of the second is nice easy 7x to the sixth power plus the second times the derivative of the first so that's going to be x to the seventh and the derivative of seven to the x is seven to the x ln seven. Where are we here? Seven to the x. I'm, I'm looking at how much how much room I don't have here. Ln seven. Okay, I'm gonna pull it way back here a little bit. So I'm gonna take out a common factor of seven to the x. So seven to the x. And then what am I left with if I do that? I have 7x to the 6th plus x to the 7th ln 7. And I could get a little better than that because I see I have x to the 6th and then x to the 7th. So I'm going to write it as x to the 6th, 7 to the x. And that's going to left me left me with this, 7 plus x ln 7. As you can tell, I still have my lovely cold. Oh dear. Okay. Sine of cos of x squared. <coughs> okay, so what you have to be careful with is that this is the angle here, right? Not the angel, but the angle. So f prime x, we don't have an exponent for the whole function here. If this was sine squared, I would put that out here, but I don't. So I'm going to do um, no exponent. So now I do function. So sine goes to cos of cos of x squared. So that's exponent, none, function, and now the angle. So I'm taking the derivative of this as an angle, cos of x squared. So that's going to be the negative sine of x squared times 2x. Did you catch all that? So cos of x goes to negative. Remember, anything starts with c goes to negative. So negative cos of x squared times the derivative of the angle for this little interior function, and that's 2x. So if I simplify that a little bit, I could write this as the cos of 
cos of x squared. Um, we've got lots of brackets here. And then times minus 2x sine x squared. That just looks a little ne neater, doesn't it? Okay, letter E. The sine of tan x. Okay, so f prime x is going to be we have no exponent. If this was sine squared, you would have to do that first, but those no. Remember the f a rule, no exponent function. Sine goes to cos, so the cos of tan x. And then the derivative of the angle, derivative of sine x is secant squared x. And that's okay, just like that. I would leave it. This one, a little more work because we have a quotient rule. So f prime x, so ho x d hi, the derivative of e to the cos x. Remember the derivative of e to anything is the same thing. I am my own function, e to the cos x. Now the derivative of the exponent. So cos goes to negative sine x. And then minus hi, e to the cos x, d ho, derivative of x is, I will put it here for you, one. And the whole thing is over ho squared. So taking out a common factor of e to the cos x here, I'm going to pull that out, e to, oh, I didn't make it as an exponent, I meant to do that. I said it, e to the cos x, and then I need a big bracket. I'm gonna make it a square one because I have some other stuff in here. So I have minus x sine x, minus x sine x, and then minus one all over x squared. And that's about as good as it can get. Okay, g, f of x equals three cos x minus e to the x. Okay, so highly recommend that you write this out first with an exponent. This whole thing is to the half power. Okay, so now when you take the derivative f prime x, remember you're going to do one half. You're gonna leave everything alone, everything inside the brackets. And you're going to remember to reduce the exponent to minus a half. Okay, so that's just the exponent. And now I'm going to do the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of three cos x, cos goes negative, so I go to negative three sine x. And the derivative of e to the x is just minus e to the x. And then if you are making it pretty, which you should do, you would have minus three sine x minus e to the x, that's sine, not six, minus three sine x minus e to the x, and then this is all in the denominator, right, because it's to the negative power. So I have two down here, and I'm going to rewrite it as the square root of three cos x minus e to the x. That's kind of messy, isn't it? Let me fix it. Always make your work neat for your teacher because nothing is worse than trying to decipher what someone has written. You just want to say, I don't know what you wrote and throw it away. This is teacher talk. That's what, what goes on in our brains. Okay, so I have y equals cos 2x sine squared 3x. Ooh, now remember this sine squared 3x. Let's get this out of the way. Should have erased all those. This is the sine of 3x squared, right? Remember I told you that if it's sine squared, put it in brackets, put it out here, or else you're going to get confused when you take the derivative. Okay, so y prime. So hopefully you're doing it the same way as me. So that's the first times the derivative of the second. Okay, square brackets because I need exponent function angle here, E, F, A, right? I need to do all of those. So the exponent gives me two sine three X to the power of one, I can leave that. So I did the exponent, that's E here. The function, the sine of three X goes to the cos of 3x, and then the angle, the derivative of 3x is 3. So all that, it's very important that you make sure you don't stop. 
EFA, right? The EFA rule, exponent function angle. So that's the hard part of it. So I did the first time derivative of the second plus the second. So now I have sine squared 3x times the derivative of cos of 2x. So cos, anything that starts with the letter C, say it all together, goes to negative. Negative sine 2x times 2. That's the angle. Okay, so I did function angle here. So if you straighten that up a little bit, you should have cos 2x, and then you have um, 3 times 2 is 6, sine 3x cos 3x. It almost looks like something that you did. Remember 2 sine x cos x? You probably could write that as a double angle, but I think that's just fine. And then I have not a plus, it's going to be a minus because I have 2 and a minus. So minus 2 and I have sine squared 3x and then sine of 2x. And that's very pretty. Okay, in the last question on this page, I have y equals sine 2x over cos of x plus 1. So the derivative now is going to be, we're going to use the quotient rule. So I do ho, which is this one. Ho, hi, ho. Remember, hi, ho. Ho, d hi, the derivative of, of the top. The derivative of sine 2x is going to be, now you should get a little faster by now, so you're going to say 2 cos 2x. We're smarter now, right? Um, so ho, d hi, minus hi, sine 2x, d ho, the derivative of cos of x plus 1 is going to be the negative sine of x plus 1. And I need some extra brackets here because that's x plus 1. I don't want to look at the sine of x plus 1. You could put brackets here, but you don't really need those ones there. Okay, and simplifying that just a little bit, put your constants out front. So I have 2 times the cos of x plus 1 times the cos of 2x. And then here I have negative, negative. That makes plus the sine. I'm going to write it in the same order as the other one. So cos x plus 1, sine x plus 1, sine 2x. And that's very lovely. Okay, so let's move on to page 2, which is going to be... Hold it over nicely for you. What is the slope of the tangent to the function 4x e to the x at the point with coordinate x equals 0? Well, that's a pretty easy question. It's actually, I don't know why it's worth 3 marks. It's probably worth 2 in my books. So I need to know the derivative. f prime x first. Product rule, right? 4x times e to the x. So I do the first times the derivative of e to the x is e to the x plus the second e to the x times the derivative of 4x, which is 4. So plus 4 e to the x. <laughs> now ask me at f prime, what's f prime at 0? So I plug in 0. This is going to be 0 times 1. I'll write it out. 0 times 1. And this one is 4 e to the 0. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. And that's going to give me 4. And our 4 slope is 4 when x equals 0. Determine the first and second derivatives of this function, f of x equals e to the 0 0.5x squared. Okay, so what's f prime x? So we have the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, right? So um, e to the 0 0.5 5x squared times the derivative of the exponent. So 0.5 times 2 is 1x. So I have this. And usually you would write it like this, x e to the 0.5x squared. Okay, now it also asks you for the second derivative. So now I'm going to use this as a product rule. So I have the first times the derivative of the second. Well, the derivative of this is all of this. We just did that one, right? So I'm just going to rewrite that. x e to the 0.5x squared 
first times the derivative of the second plus the second, which is e to the 0 0.5x squared times the derivative of x, which is 1. So e to the 0 0.5x squared. Okay, so now I look for a common factor, and that would be this e to 0.5x squared. I'm going to pull that out. e to the 0.5x squared. And what am I left with here? Well, this would be x squared. And then this would just be 1. Okay, so there's your first and second derivatives. Question number four, a little word problem for you. <coughs> it says a boy is selling lemonade through the, out the hot summer. Suppose the number of cups sold is given by this function, where the price x in dollars determines the number of cups sold per day n in hundreds. What is the max, What price maximizes the number of cups sold and how many cups are sold at this price? Okay, so we're trying to find the derivative, set it to zero to find the maximum. So let's do the derivative, m prime x. So look carefully because again we have a product rule here, x times 2 to the negative x. So I'm going to do the first times the derivative, the derivative of 2 to the minus x. That's like b to the x, right? b to the x ln b. You should be saying that to yourself. So a to the x ln 2 and the derivative of negative x is negative 1 plus the second, which is 2 to the minus x, times the derivative of x, which is 1. And now you should take out a common factor. I have a negative here, so I'm going to take out a negative 2 to the negative x and see what I'm left with. And that would give me x ln 2. So x ln 2 plus, not plus, I took out a negative, so this has to be minus 1. Okay, so now I'm going to say for critical values, set n prime of x equal to 0. So remember, this can never be 0. You can never have an exponential function equal to 0. Remember, that is always an asymptote. So I can't say 0 for this. 2 to any power is never 0, but this could be set equal to 0. So I set x ln 2 minus 1 equal to 0. And that's going to give you x equals, bring the 1 over, divide by ln 2. So x equals 1 over ln 2. And if you put that into your lovely trusty calculator, you should get about 1.44. So that's the selling price, $1.44 per cup. And the question is, how many cups are sold at this price? So n of x, I want to go back to this original function and figure out how many are sold at a price of 1 over ln 2. So I'm going to say, what is n at 1 over ln 2? And again, my pencil is giving me a bit of trouble here. And that's going to be 1 over ln 2 times 2 to the negative 1 over ln 2 plus 2. And you can do all that on your calculator as well, and you would get about 2.53. Now remember that your answer has to answer the question properly, how many cups are sold? It's not two and a half cups because this is the number of cups in hundreds. So therefore, 253 cups are sold at $1.44 each. Okay, so that's your first word problem. Now uh, let's flip over here and we have a kind of a graphing question that says for the function f of x equals x cubed e to the x, determine the intervals of increase and decrease. Determine the absolute minimum value. So if I do the derivative, if I want to find the um, critical values, you have to take the derivative. So here we go again, the derivative. So first, x cubed times the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Plus the second, e to the x times the derivative of the first is 3x squared. And that's going to give you, let's take out a common factor of x squared e to the x. And that leaves me with x plus 3. 
Okay, so for critical values, we're going to set f prime x equal to zero. Now, this could be zero on this side because x squared could be equal to zero. So I'm going to say x is equal to zero. And what makes this bracket equal to zero? Well, that would be minus three. Okay, so now I'm going to use my first derivative test to prove if I found a minimum. So I'm going to call this f prime x, and I'm going to check between minus 3 and my other critical value here being 0. So I want to know what happens to the slope in each of these zones. So you can pick any number you like that's less than minus 3. I'm going to choose minus 4. So best to plug it into this equation right here, right? Because if I put in minus 4 here, minus 4 squared, that's positive. This is always going to be positive, and I have minus 4 plus 3 is negative, making the whole thing negative, so this is decreasing slope. If I go over here, let's say we just pick minus 1, because that's a nice number to work with. So I square it, e to the negative 1, all this is positive, but minus 1 plus 3 is also positive. So this is positive, and we have increasing or positive slope. On the other side of zero, if I put in one or two or three or four, anything I put in here, this is going to be positive. This is still positive, so this is positive as well. So that means that zero is neither a minimum or a maximum value. It's just positive slope and more positive slope. You could have a slope of zero there, so something that goes kind of like that at that point. So... Um, it's not a maximum or a minimum value though. Okay, so I have zero and minus three and I want to know, it asked you where it was increasing or decreasing. So I'm going to give you the interval. So it's increasing for X is an element of, so minus three to zero. And because it's not increasing right here, it's neither increasing nor decreasing, we should separate them and say zero to infinity. And where is it decreasing? Well, x is an element of negative infinity to minus 3. Okay, and finally, part B says determine the absolute minimum value. So this is where the minimum is going to occur. So minimum at x equals minus 3. And I need to know what that value is. So I have to plug it back into the original equation to find the height when x is minus 3. So I have minus 3 cubed, e to the minus 3, and minus 3 cubed would be negative 27, and e to the minus 3, I can stick it in the denominator here like this. And you could go on to evaluate that by dividing minus 27 by e cubed, and that would come out to about minus 1.34. So that would be the minimum value, and are we missing anything? No. Okay, determine the absolute extreme values for the function. Now I just did a whole lesson on this, um, a whole video on it from question six, I think that was 2.4, and I showed you how to find all these values. So, so this one is, um, it's very similar to one of the ones from the homework. So if you do f prime x, the derivative of sine x is cos x. And the derivative of negative cos x, so cos x goes to negative sine x. So negative negative is plus sine x. And the derivative of 6 is just 0. So now for critical values, we set f prime x equal to 0. And if I set that equal to 0, I can rearrange this equation to have negative sine x divided by cos x being equal to 1. And that means that tan x is going to be equal to negative 1. So if tan x is negative 1, you should know from your special triangles that that means pi over 4. Where I want to know where it is, though, I need to know where is tan negative. So it's C, A, S, and T. So I want to be in these two quadrants here with acute angles of pi over 4 here, the related acutes. So from here to here is how far. Always a good idea to write this like 4 pi over 4, 
8 pi over 4, so you don't make a mistake. That's 2 pi and 1 pi. So 4 pi over 4 minus pi over 4, that gives me x is equal to 3 pi over 4. And the other value way around here would be 8 minus 1 is 7 pi over 4. Okay, so now the tricky part that you need to check 0, 2 pi, this one and this one to figure out what the height is at each of those values. So for some reason, I didn't leave my students very much room for this, but I'll, I'll try to squeeze it in. So when x is equal to 0, f at 0 is going to give me the sine of 0 minus the cos of 0. So all I'm doing is plugging it back into the original function to find the height when x is 0. So um, sine of 0, of course, is 0. The negative cos of 0 would be minus 1 plus 6. And that's going to give me 5. I'm going to go to the other end first because you're going to see that we get kind of the same thing happening out here. When x is 2 pi, f at 2 pi is going to be the sine of 2 pi minus the cos of 2 pi plus 6. I'm going to squeeze that in. And the sine of 2 pi again is 0 and the negative of the cos of 2 pi is going to be um, minus 1 because cos remember goes like this so 2 pi is 1 and 0 is 1 and the minus of it it would be minus 1 plus 6 and that's going to give me 5 as well so at the end points I have 0 and 5 2 pi and 5 but now I need to check the 3 pi over 4 so when x equals 3 pi over 4 You've got to plug all that back in here. So f at 3 pi over 4 is going to be the sine of 3 pi over 4 minus the cos of 3 pi over 4 plus 6. So now remember, if you do the sine of 3 pi over 4, that puts you in here. Sine is positive in this quadrant, so that's the same thing as the sine of pi over 4. Now, if I go to minus the cos of 3 pi over 4, the cos of 3 pi over 4, when I'm in this quadrant, is going to be negative. So it's the negative of the negative. So that's plus cos of pi over 4, plus 6. And these, of course, are 1 over root 2, plus 1 over root 2, plus 6. And if you add these together, you'd get 2 over root 2, rationalizing the denominator by multiplying by root 2 over root 2. I did that in that, that um, homework question as well. So you're going to get um, minus root 2 or plus 2 root 2, 2 root 2 plus 6. That's going to give me um, 6 plus the square root of 2, which is approximately 7.41. Okay, I'm going to do the second one right here because this question doesn't take as much room as this one is taking. So now I want to do f at, we did 3 pi over 4, I want to do 7 pi over 4. So that's the sine of 7 pi over 4. Remember you're plugging it back into the original function minus the cos of 7 pi over 4 plus 6. So now you need to write this as a related acute angle. So 7 pi over 4, that's going to be negative, right? Because I'm in this quadrant and only cos is positive. So that's the negative sine of pi over 4. And minus the cos of 7 pi over 4, that's going to be, um, it's going to be positive, right? The cos of pi over 4. So minus the cos of pi over 4. And then plus 6. So now I have minus 1 over root 2 minus 1 over root 2 plus 6 and minus 1 over 2 minus 1 over root 2 is going to be minus root 2 plus 6 and that comes out to about where did I do that uh, about 4.59 so you can see from your final solutions here that this is going to be a max at and I'm going to say 3 pi over 4 and 6 plus root 2 because 5 these are 5 this is 7 that's bigger than 5 and this is lower than 5 so this is my minimum 
minimum at 7 pi over 4 and 4.59 or I would I would still leave it as minus 2 minus root 2 plus 6 uh, it's good that you find this because maybe you don't know what's minus root 2 plus 6 is that smaller or bigger than 5 right okay so let's go to number 7 I'm getting tired you probably want to go to bed too the decay of a certain substance is multiplied by this equation for the number of particles represented by n in a time of t hours. What is the initial number of the particles? Initial number means what's the number at time zero? And that's going to give you 100 times 3 plus e to the zero. Um, times e to the zero. So e to the zero is 1. And... Funny I did that wrong the last time. So if this is 0, I have e to the 0 is 1. 3 plus 1 is 4 times 100. I should have 400 particles. Part B. Determine the rate of change in the number of particles at time t. So that's any time t. So it's just asking you for the derivative function. So n prime of t is going to be, you can leave the constant out front. Constant times a function is the derivative the constant times the derivative of the function, right? Okay, so if I take the derivative of this, the derivative of 3 is 0, the derivative of e to the negative t over 3, so I have an exponent of minus 1 third, so that's going to be minus 1 third e to the minus t over 3. So that's at any time t, right? Any time t. And c says how fast are the number of particles changing when t is 3 I plug in 3 for my hours and I get minus 1 third e I put in 3 for t that gives me e to the negative 1 and that would be minus 100 and in the denominator I have 3 e and you can calculate that and you should because you want to know um, how fast the number of particles is changing. So you want to know how many, right? So that's approximately uh, minus 12.26. So decreasing at 12.26. You don't say decreasing negatively, okay? So you could say minus 12.26 particles per hour, but if you're decreasing, it would be positive. Decreasing at 12.26 because that implies a negative for you particles per hour and there's the end of page three. Ooh, this was a long test for my students okay the next question is probably the last really long one it says the effectiveness of studying for an exam which you should really know about right depends on how many hours a student studies for a certain exam, a student is given one day to study. So you got 24 hours, that's it, that's all. Some experiments show that if the effectiveness E is put on a scale of 0 to 6, then the effectiveness for T equals T, 2 to the negative T over 10, where T is the number of hours spent studying. How many hours should a student study to achieve maximum effectiveness? So you're trying to find the maximum value of this, and it's calculus, and guess what you have to do? Take the derivative. Surprise, surprise. So e prime of t, this is a product rule. t times 2 to the negative t over 10. So I'm going to do the first times the derivative of the second. So the derivative of the second, I'm going to write it up here a little bit. So t, 2 to the minus t over 10. So this is like b to the x ln b. So here's my b to the x ln b times the derivative of the exponent is minus 1 over 10. So I have minus 1 over 10, 2 to the negative t over 10 ln 2. That's the first times the derivative of the second. Don't stop, don't stop, plus the second 2 to the negative t over 10 times the derivative of the first. Derivative of t is 1. All is good. Let's put it there just so you know that we didn't forget about it. Okay, so e prime of t. Now let's take out a common factor. Let's take out this. 
right? 2 to the negative t over 10. And I make my bracket, and I'm left with, this was minus here. You can't see it. So it's minus t over 10 ln 2 plus 1. There we go. Okay, so now that we found that, we need to solve for critical values. Set e prime of t equal to 0. This is never 0. This could be 0. So that gives me, um, let's do it this way. So we have t over 10 ln 2 is equal to 1. So I brought this to the other side and switcherooed them. So t is going to be, I have to multiply by 10 and divide by ln 2. So t equals 10 divided by ln 2. And if you do that on your trusty calculator again, you would get about 14.43 hours. Now, if you're going to give um, like 14.43 hours, maybe you want to say 14 hours and how many minutes is 40.43 Oops, what's that doing there? Clear. So 0.43 times 60, that's going to give you 25, almost 26 minutes. So 14 hours, 26 minutes. That's a lot of studying in one hour. I don't know that that would be terribly effective, especially for math. Okay, so it says you must check the endpoints, which was kind of a clue. <coughs> But you should be doing that anyway. So I have to check. Let's say I don't study at all. What's the effectiveness of that? So E at 0. If I put in 0 here, I'm going to get my effectiveness is 0. I didn't study. I didn't get any marks. Well, maybe you still learned something. How about I study for 24 hours? Now you'd think that might be higher. But as you know... You get really tired and then things don't work so well. So never study for a full 24 hours. You will not be successful. So I'm going to do 24 times 2 to the minus 24 over 10. And you could do this just as, you know, you could write it like this. 24 times 2 to the minus 2.4, which is easier to plug in your calculator. You don't make mistakes. And when I do that, I get about 4.55. Now remember, this is an effectiveness scale. So 4.5 out of 6. Now let's do the magic one that we think is going to be perfect. And we're going to put in um, 10 over ln 2. Let's be really exact here. So I'm going to get 10 over ln 2 and times 2 to the minus 10 over ln 2 divided by 10. So that's like times 1 over 10, right? So if you do this, it's just really 1 over ln 2 minus 1 over ln 2, you should get approximately 5.45. So that's pretty darn effective. Maybe. <laughs> Doesn't tell you what your mark's going to be, but it's the most effective way. And it depends, of course, on the exam. As you know, math you have to do all longer. You can study forever and not get anywhere. Okay, explain how to derive the derivative of the function f of x equals secant x two different ways. Hmm. Hint, they're similar, but use different rules. Okay, so what I wanted my students to do, and some of them got it right away, and some thought, oh, I, don't, I don't even know what you're asking. You can write secant x as being 1 over cos x, or secant x is equal to the cos of x, cos x to the negative 1. So what I was trying to get was that they would use a quotient rule and they would use a chain rule. So if y equals cos 1 over cos x, then y prime would be, I'm going to do the quotient rule, I'm going to do both of them. So I do ho d high is 0 minus high, which is 1. The derivative of cos is minus sine x over cos squared x. So that gives me sine x over cos squared x. And that's the same as having 
sine x over cos x times 1 over cos x, which is what we're trying to get to here, because this is tan, so you get tan x secant x, and that is the derivative of secant x. So if I do this one, I would do the same thing. So let's, let's call this y, okay? And then I would do y prime is going to be, not double, just one, minus the cos of x to the minus two times the derivative of the inside, which is going to be minus the sine of x. So you can see I'm going to have the same thing. I have sine x over cos squared x, and I'm not going to write this out twice. You can follow through over here and get to the right answer. So the end of this test says, congratulations, you completed your last unit test in high school mathematics. That's if you did calculus second. Um, if not, there's a little thing here. It says, how do I transfer into the, I can't read it anymore. It's like, how do I get out of math somehow? And this one says, Entering math fail, please derive carefully. I know it's a really bad joke, but I thought I would end with that. So hope this helps you out. It's very long, very, very long, but you can skim through it and find the parts you need. Good luck on your test, and I wish you all the best. Subscribe, tell all your friends, and like and comment. I like it. Bye-bye.